Hey everyone, welcome back to Primetime. This is Dr. Chad Koontz, and as always, thank you so much for tuning in. I'm really excited to talk to you guys today about how you can help yourself return back to playing golf and or tennis after our rotator cuff surgery. In fact, quite a few people end up having to unfortunately have a rotator cuff surgery as we get older. And I picked both the sports. It's kind of a country club kind of idea. You know, you, you're signed up as a member to one of these country clubs, um, golf and tennis. They're both sports that you can you can really truly play um, without really any age limit. You know, it's you know golf specifically. It's one of those fun things you want to try to shoot your age one day, right? So if you're 80, you're trying to you know shoot an 80 score. In tennis, there's even different leagues as you get older. So it's just one of those things that uh, a couple of those sports that you can just continue to play as you get older um, keeps you active, keeps you socially active, keeps your head with it keeps you moving and so I want to help you guys you know continue to play uh, both the sports even after sustaining a rotator cuff surgery um, as you can imagine and, and maybe as you are kind of going through it um, depending where you're at you might be starting to ask yourself man I'm not so sure I can even play those two sports again because those sports both are so heavily demanding on my shoulder to actually do what they need to do and rotator cuff surgeries are really intense okay rotator cuff surgeries are very very challenging. I've worked with what feels like hundreds, if not maybe thousands at this point, of rotator cuff surgery uh, repairs or protocols. And honestly, some of the challenging uh, components about it is because everyone is a little bit different. You gotta take into consideration that the injury you had, your athletic, uh, your, your athleticism, your range of motion, your strength, uh, the quality of that joint, all of those factors going into the surgery make a pretty significant impact. And then the surgery themselves, I feel like uh, the surgery themselves are consistently changing. We're kind of in this time period where different surgeons are playing with um, different types of protocols and different types of ways to perform the surgeries. So you're going to get you know, a little bit of a different angle on that. And then also I have to kind of uh, do justice to inform you that you know, not every rotator cuff tear is created equal. Right? They really divide them, and I'm not going to get too far into it, but they divide the rotator cuff tear into length and width. Uh, length would be, you know, small would be less than one centimeter, medium would be between one to three centimeters, large would be between three to five centimeters, uh, and massive would be greater than five centimeters. So there's a length component that you've got to be considerate of, and then there's also a depth component. If I remember right, I want to say the depth was either less than one centimeter, which is small, medium would be between one to three centimeters, and a large depth rotator cuff tear would be between three to five. Um, and then they you know, furthermore divide it into different types of classifications. So you have to kind of think through that. Now, the good news in terms of simplicity is that most of you, if you had a rotator cuff tear, hopefully most of you it would be only or isolated to the supraspinatus. So the supraspinatus is a muscle that sits kind of on top of the shoulder. It's your primary arm um, muscle that helps drive your elbow up and away from your body into what I call abduction. And it does some rotation as well. It does some external rotation. Now, typically that is a rotator cuff tear um, or that is a rotator cuff that's involved solely in the tear. The next level up, if you, if you really did a good one, you'd also have a tear in the infraspinatus. It's usually round number two. Um, and round number three would actually be the Terry's minor. Okay, so that's if you really did a massive tear and if you did the complete shebang, you really did it all, you'd have the subscapularis involved too. All right, so rotator cuff tear surgeries and getting you back to playing those two sports um, with golf and tennis. Now, first off, just to get range of motion, just to get, I'm not gonna even say pain-free range of motion, but just to get full range of motion where you can actively lift your arm up above your head. We're looking at usually 12 weeks, all right? We're looking at 12 weeks just for you to be able to get your arm all the way up overhead. And I've talked to a lot of, you know, quite a few surgeons and, and some of my clients and they say, you know, my doctor said I, I really shouldn't even expect to get all the way up overhead in terms of my range of motion again. So I think, you know, the, the pain is just so intense for most of my clients following that surgery. Some of you are lucky, you know, some of you get through with it and you're like, well, I'm moving pretty good, it's not a problem. But most of the time, uh, the, the pain of the shoulder is very intense when trying to get into overhead motion again. 
um, I feel like you have to be somewhat crafty to kind of work with the joint to try to get into pain-free overhead motion as much as possible. The slings make it tough. I feel like a lot of people are having trouble sleeping at night, which doesn't help with the recovery process and people are just generally uncomfortable because most often it's even their, their dominant arm and their arm's kind of stuck, stuck in the sling. But nonetheless, guys, we're looking at about 12 weeks um, to have full range of motion and you should be incorporating some level of some strengthening exercises, usually around two months post-op. And again, there are varying different degrees, but we're, we're looking somewhere around six to eight weeks after you had your surgery that you're starting to incorporate some at-home strengthening-based exercises. What we're really here to talk to is what's after that. What's required after you just get your full range of motion? And as you'll hear with a lot of my stories on podcasts and as you just hear, hear me out, getting you confident in that sport specific range of motion is so important and we've got to justify it we've got to be able to justify it mechanically that you can you know swing your arm as fast as you want let's just use the tennis serve for example that's a really aggressive move for the rotator cuff so as you go to toss the ball and as you go to reach up uh, to swing that and you, your arms way overhead your rotator cuff remember has a purpose to compress the joint and depress the joint. So you can see if you're watching this on a visual, you can see my hands away from my femur, or excuse me, from the head of the shoulder. Um, it, it pulls it down, it pulls, if you can imagine this on the podcast, if you're listening in, it pulls the head of the shoulder down away from the acromion. So it actually gives you that space. And we need to keep that space as you reach up overhead. A lot of post rotator cuff surgery clients who are trying to get back to playing tennis and golf they have trouble with that overhead move because if the rotator cuff isn't firing properly is if it's not strong enough if it hasn't learned to kind of co-activate and and co-stabilize um, the head of your shoulder will actually slide up north it can run into problems like the subacromial bursa the subdeltoid bursa uh, hopefully they've done debridement to the surgery so there's no osteophytes or bone spurs hanging off but you could potentially kind of start banging back up into that acromion in the future causing yourself another bone spur. So getting the shoulder and the rotator cuff to actually fire and get strong overhead is going to be incredibly important for you, particularly with the tennis serve. Now, with regards to golf, when you go into the backswing, um, the rotator cuff has to shorten and you have to have a lot of range of motion when you're golfing and you go into your backswing. If you take a look, at um, a professional golfer when they go back into the backswing they have about 80 to 90 degrees that can be very challenging in my experience for a lot of rotator cuff surgeries um, for you to get to that full motion um, I find though that there's a lot more guarding than there actually is mechanical justification for you to not get into that end range of motion meaning it's not like you've got a bony block or something that limits you from going there a lot of times this is musculoskeletal, that your muscles like your lats, like your pecs, heck even your anterior, anterior delt, these muscles get really tight and they don't allow the head of that shoulder to move where it needs to. It kind of locks it up. Uh, if you can imagine gears to the watch, right? The gears work all together in order for that watch to, kit, to tick. It's kind of like putting a monkey wrench in between that and all of a sudden it can't move and you just find yourself stuck. And you're thinking to yourself, well, maybe something went wrong with the rotator cuff surgery itself, or maybe he didn't clean it out right. No, a lot of times the body is very protective. It's guarding. It's not really trusting the body to be able to go back into that full range of motion. So loosening up the tissues, getting stronger, again, being specific to that golf swing position where you're reaching back, practicing that exercise can be incredibly important. And then for the golf follow through, your muscles, your rotator cuff muscles need to learn how to go on to stretch safely, okay? A lot of times, in my experience working with these clients, when I try to really start stretching it, they get apprehensive. It's kind of like they visualize themselves maybe almost wanting uh, to think that, that the rotator cuff will tear again, right? And so fear plays a big role in the body holding yourself back from getting these full range of motion. So what happens if you don't truly get those full ranges of motion and then you go out and you try to swing a big driver without warming up because you're scared, but you still want to do it. You know, that's actually when you're at risk to hurting yourself. You know, you're at, actually at a much, much better chance to confidently 
intelligently yet aggressively get into these sport specific motions under of course the healthcare supervision provider that you're working with um, so that you have that confidence and then um, with regards to golf start slow <clears throat> you know work with your provider but there's nothing nothing wrong with even just grabbing a putter and just you know banging away 100 putts and just starting there if you're really trying to get back in the game of golf uh, next step you know just work your way up the ladder start with your sandwich and start small start with 15 balls if you're you know clear to do it but you're still kind of nervous start with just 15 sandwich shots and start at like 50 percent you know you're barely swinging through it work your way up into the pitching wedge nine iron and this doesn't even have to be on the same day right it's not like you have to get a hundred bucket of balls and then work your way all up all the way up to the driver the first time you get in the driving range um, you could do that over the course of weeks now obviously sooner is better you know i for me personally, and if I was clear to go, I'd want to go play 18 holes with my buddies right away. Um, but we do have to do it somewhat intelligently and, and, ob and objectively to prove to ourselves that we're ready to take that next big step. So, you know, working your way up to seven iron. And let's just say, let's just say you felt a little uneasy, you felt a little twinge with the five iron. Well, I'd stick up to the five iron, you know, five iron below, six iron, seven iron, eight iron, etc. And I would get really confident and comfortable there and kind of work with my provider and say, you know, why did I feel that twinge? Did I swing harder? Um, do I not have the strength yet to be able to justify that much more leverage and that velocity? And really kind of just detail it out, figure out why wasn't I able to do that the way I wanted to pain free. Instead of just saying, whoops, I can't do this again. You know, I guess I'll just have to hit a six iron off the tee every time. But do your due diligence and work with a provider to see what, what does it take. I'm a big fan of recording these motions, getting a slow motion visual. Maybe something changed. If nothing changed, then we know it's strength related and it's time to get back in the gym and keep working out and strengthen that baby for maybe, you know, let's say two weeks and let's go after it again on the range. Let's get out that five iron. Let's see if I can do it pain free. Chances are you'll be able to. Tennis, what's great about this is that we can kind of emulate and mimic the same things as what I just said with golf, which is kind of why they go together. There's kind of this transverse plane, this rotational movement required in both of them. So with tennis, you know, analogous to the backswing of a golf, you're going to go into the backswing um, of your shot. And if your right arm, it's reaching back, you know, with your right arm, you want to take that slow and you might want to only do that, you know, 50%. And the initial contact with the tennis racket into the ball can be challenging. So you might want to just start babying it, you know, just where you just make a little bit of contact, start with slow speed. You may not even hit over the net, like maybe you're just hitting it into the side of a wall, like a practice wall, you know, that you're hitting into. The backswing, the backhand for a tennis player can be challenging, kind of like the follow through for a golfer, because you're putting those muscles on stretch. And not only are you putting muscles on stretch, but you're actually asking your muscles to come out of that with some form of velocity. So I find that a backhand is probably more challenging than a forehand for my tennis players because they have to put the muscles on stretch and then generate force. So for you, you know, you're gonna have to learn how to just get into that pain-free stretch position and then just work on slowly coming out of it. Um, another nice way to practice this, if you can, is getting into a pool. And this goes for both my golfers and uh, my tennis players. Grab, um, they have different types of things you can buy, but Something that adds a little resistance into the pool, you know, where you're you're just creating a little bit of turbulence and resistance and you're going back and forth, just kind of mimicking that forehand and backhand or back swing or back part of your swing or your forswing um, as you're coming through. And that can give you actually a little bit of resistance where you actually have to generate some force, but you've got some buoyancy to support your arm. So there's something to be said about kind of a aquatics training, um, which I would guess somewhere between even a couple months post-op and thereafter would be a great thing to kind of interject to add in just some movement and again some sport specific movement because if you're one you know just goes around everyday life grabbing your coffee newspaper you know driving all of a sudden you get on the tennis court you have it warmed up you're late and you're up next to serve and you're you know three months post we'll say four months post-op or six months post-op surgery that's still a lot for you you know that's still a lot so um, just kind of something to keep in mind so we've talked about a lot so far, and I just want to also mention the importance of a proper warm-up as we're kind of segueing from that. I know for me personally as a golfer, I, don't ha I haven't dabbled too much in the tennis, but as a golfer, um, I've seen the tendency for golfers to just get out onto the tee, they're late, and they just start swinging it. 
and, and not that you even have to make a big social like event that, that you're warming up when you get out there with your guys because I know how that is guys or gals might pick on each other but you know it could be super simple just grabbing an elastic band and uh, if you're welcome to kind of email me uh, shoot me a message if you're kind of interested in a warm-up I'm sure we could get you some videos but um, the point is here that you need to be able to just have a simple five-minute warm-up uh, particularly for golf just to kind of get the blood flow into there get some confidence make sure things are feeling good as well as for tennis I, I think I'd like to kind of get a little bit more of a warm-up in tennis I'm thinking more 10 to 15 minutes a little bit more dynamic guys and get the blood flowing and again just making sure that you're safe I think after rotator cuff surgery you just want to put a little bit of more WD-40 on the shoulder if you know what I mean a little bit more blood flow into there before you really get out there and get aggressive I just think that's that's really smart as well as a cool down right you know just spending a few minutes five minutes afterwards stretching maybe chatting with your guys about how the game went or uh, how the tennis match went and just do yourself a favor making sure you do a little cool down it's not uncommon for people to be a little achy and sore whether they played 18 holes of golf or they they play they played three sets uh, doubles even or singles um, and that's where you can either use a combination of ice or heat if you want to take a little bit of Advil you know to kind of keep it done but but the point is guys um, in this modern day and age if you have a pretty significant rotator cuff tear and you have surgery the fact is that you should still be able to go out there and compete you should still be able to find a way to compete at some level some level and modify things and then let me also just kind of leave you with you with this thought guys it's really important for both these sports for you to have uh, addressed your entire kinesthetic chains limitations what I mean by that is uh, for instance if you're having trouble with your backswing in uh, actually yeah in, in golf you know it requires your whole body to move it requires your hips to move it requires your knees your back your trunk your rib cage hopefully not your neck right because for golf your, your chin should stay down but you get the point really the entire body should be as primed as possible to help assist in this case your rotator cuff surgery so that your rotator cuff surgery doesn't have to do as much work same thing for tennis if you're going to toss that ball up and go for that serve your spine better have really good extension your hip strength may, may need to be really strong into hip extension uh, strong quads strong legs strong core so think about it also in a way that you want to now assist your shoulder as much as possible chances are most likely you're not a hundred percent or not what it used to be but if you can support it by strengthening up everything else around your body heck you might even do better than before because you've actually strengthened the weak links that you had in your games does this take work does this take an off-season strength and conditioning program does this take time money and energy to work with a provider to work with you over time to figure out how to break through all these limitations absolutely so at this point it's just how badly do you want to be able to continue to play as you get older at your country club or whatever it is and enjoy life and playing with your kids or their grandkids uh, for me there's no price on that uh, health is everything to me it truly is and it continues to show itself like that as I get older so guys if you guys have any additional questions please feel free to reach out to me at chad k at pr1memovement.com um, it's been my absolute pleasure and have a great rest of your day thank you